Hello, this is Ollie Furnival. Welcome to this presentation on classroom management with the aim of giving advice to new and existing teachers, um, advice and strategies on how to improve classroom management in the classes that you teach. Here are my contact details. Um, please contact me in any of these three ways. If there's anything I say in the, this presentation that you'd like more information on, I'll put these um, details up at the end of the presentation too. The presentation is to give you advice um, from my own experiences. I've been teaching um, for the last 20 years um, through um, comprehensive school in England, teaching citizenship and humanities in England, and I now teach the International Baccalaureate in Japan. Um, one of the things I found most surprising at the start of my teaching career was that not every student showed the same um, enthusiasm um, for my lessons as I did, even though it took me hours to plan them. There were many times in classes where students would challenge um, the lessons, challenge what I was asking them to do and show um, poor behaviour. And what I'd like to do is share some of the advice I've been given and some of the things I've put into place over the years to um, help you if you need um, some ideas on how to improve student um, behaviour and classroom management in your um, teaching careers. Um, part one of this presentation will be looking at how to deal with um, the whole school and how, how you act within the whole school can improve your relationship with students, um, parents and colleagues. Um, and as, as um, stakeholders, you can all work together to improve what goes on within the classroom. And part two, and as you can see, is some strategies that you can do in the classroom. Um, I'll let you read them all for yourself, but I'll be going through these and please um, pause the presentation as you go. Here are some of the things that um, I will be talking about as I go through. Okay, so please press pause if you'd like uh, longer to read these. Okay, so part one, I'm going to talk about the whole school. Uh, 1.1 is looking to get uh, to know the students outside of the classroom. Um, in my experience, um, knowing and showing an interest in students has been absolutely key to improve behaviour in my classes. I believe the more time you put in um, getting to know the students outside of the classroom, um, the more success you'll have with managing their behaviour inside of the classroom. Um, teaching is much more than the one hour a day you have with, with each student in your class. Um, I made it my mission early on to get to know the poorly behaved students and take an interest in them and, and um, what motivates them. It doesn't in, in any way mean you lower your expectations of them and their behaviour. That still remains at the highest level throughout your career. But the more you get to know students, you can work with them to let you know that you're actually on a journey together with, with them through their school life, as opposed to being um, against them. All students obviously have interests and hobbies um, outside of school. Um, and some can be really quite inspiring um, to hear about and amazing when you, when you learn about what they get up to. Um, I made an effort, uh, firstly, um, as, a, as a form tutor and a classroom teacher to learn what students are doing in their spare time. The um, sports they like, the football team they play for, the type of music they're listening to. Um, and as you speak to students inside or outside of the classroom, just asking them how the netball or skating or fishing is going or finding out um, their team's football results. Um, which you can comment on as you see them in the um, corridor as you're walking past or when you're on duty, it may only take one second in the day, but can go a long way to building up a relationship and improving behaviour with that student as it gives um, them a connection to you. Similarly to that, going to a school show um, that you, you've seen a student um, acting in uh, or congratulating students that you've heard on a good performance in such a show or for the sports team, next time you see them, is a very easy and very effective way of building up a positive relationship with the student. As well as that, it goes to show them that you see them as an individual, not just a silent member, uh, one member lost in, in the class that you only see uh, once a day, for example. Um, knowledge gained about students can come, um, come in very useful. Um, and, and, and there's loads of ways you can do that. You can do that through speaking um, to students themselves or learning out through them, uh, through, through form tutors, through colleagues, I mean, quizzes, or just getting a chance to talk to them um, um, for the extra minute or so that you have maybe at the end of a parent's evening. I believe that narratives are essential to good lesson activities and using a narrative with your relationship with a student um, and relating to their interests can show them that you are indeed interested in who they are. Um, for, and a quick example of this is a difficult students I had in year eight uh, many years ago when I was teaching citizenship and I found out that they were really big into the Simpsons. I used this information on them to change the way I was teaching public and private services. What I did was I incorporated clips of Springfield, the town in the Simpsons cartoon, 
um, into the class um, as a way of differentiating what places in Springfield are in the public and the private sector. A small change to my lesson plan, but it worked really well um, and it helped me use the students' interest to help get my learning points across. Um, getting to know students does take time, but putting in the effort to talk to them and treating them as individuals has gone, I believe, a long way um, in my career in helping me improve uh, behaviour in lessons. Um, creating a positive relationship uh, with students um, spreads quickly throughout the year group, um, the school, and it even gets it gets through to home and it can um, be beneficial uh, when you need to speak to uh, parents about um, difficult issues. Um, for example, um, a student I had who I, I, I dealt with many, many times um, through difficult situations did tell me after she left school that she really appreciated how um, I spoke to her on her level and took time to see things on her point of view. I think as teachers, we should never underestimate the power of listening to someone who feels they are never heard, which some students may feel is that case. Even when you have to tell students something they don't want to hear, it's important that they feel that you're listening to them, you're getting to understand where they're coming from, and you're giving them a chance to have their say. We all feel like, we all um, feel we'd like um, to be listened to, and that's no different for teenagers um, in school. Um, listening to a student um, didn't result in, in what she wanted all the time. Uh, didn't result in her getting her own way. It doesn't always work that way, unfortunately, in life, and it's a good life lesson for the student, but allows them to have the chance to have their say and put their point across. Um, talking to students allows teachers to see how school is from their point of view as well, and it will allow you to maybe respond um, directly to their experiences. And if this is done um, through you, honestly, it can strengthen your position and the school's position when, as I said, you may have to talk about things students um, don't want to hear. So as I said, it doesn't mean you agree with students all the time, but I found that if you speak to students um, in a respectful manner, uh, with reasons to back up what you want to say, um, you will on the whole get respect back from them and accept the situation, even if they do not have what they wanted. Um, parents appreciate teachers, um, of course, who are approachable to them and their child especially. As I said earlier, this will get back to them. and to, um, they, they like you to explain uh, whether the behaviour has been acceptable or not and take an interest in where the student's coming through um, from in their behaviour. Um, referring to an outside uh, student's outside interest does go down well with parents during parents' evenings and shows the parents you're treating their child as a human being and not just um, one of however many hundreds of students you have uh, in, your, in your school life. Um, I do remember one example of a, a parent who I had in my um, form who was having lots of issues many different issues in school, leading the parent to be very defensive the first few times I met her. Um, at one um, parents' evening, I found out that her and her daughter were going to um, a Take That concert, and me giving a few quips about Take That and explaining how not my um, cup of tea, but I enjoy hearing um, how the daughter goes to the concert, helped the parent visibly relax and led to the start of a good relationship um, with her. And this came in useful when having to deal with the parent on difficult subjects in the future. Um, it's vital that when, as we get to know students, we understand that they're individuals and remember that they do make mistakes and they are teenagers. Uh, learning the background of the student um, can be done with the help of colleagues, as, as I will come to in a minute. Uh, most importantly um, is getting to know the students um, and their experiences, talking to them, listening to them. Um, and this can be done, as I will speak to later in this presentation, um, through things like detentions as well which can help you with your um, classroom management is being seen um, around school. Having a high, high profile around school is key to building up uh, your reputation, which can go a long way to lead to, lead to better behaviour from your students. Um, it can be seen to help you get positive relationships and it can be seen, you will be seen by students as an important part of the school community. This can be done through many ways. Um, I made an, um, a point of standing in, in my, um, outside my classroom in a very busy corridor between lessons um, every single time a lesson changes in the, in the day. Uh, this is a good way to help keep order in a crowded corridor, but it can also be seen by all the students that you're a proactive member of staff who's taking an interest in whole school behaviour. And it shows students that you're willing to face up and get involved in any misbehaviour, which will, and then you will get a reputation as a, as a teacher who doesn't cower away, but actually faces up to any issue that's going on. Um, on. As well as keeping an eye on bad behaviour, it's a really good opportunity to say hello to students in the corridor. As mentioned earlier, learning about students and their outside interests, you know, friendly hello or comment about last night's football result or what happened on a TV show the night before is a good way to show them that you're human and help to build up um, better relationships between you. Um, 
having a high profile in other places in school, um, such as running a club, um, volunteering to go on school trips, um, <coughs> um, going on um, duties, which in some schools you, you will have no choice to do, but actually going on extra duties um, in different um, parts of the school, which I will come to in a minute, also um, show students that you are a member of the community and not um, a teacher who's isolated on their own, um, which some students like to think they can take advantage of. Um, so going, going to duties, um, a colleague and, and a good friend of mine purposely chose to do extra duties, lunchtime um, duties, and we volunteered for duty points um, at the toughest in the toughest places in the school, places such as where students were smoking, um, places where they tried to escape out of school um, at break time to go to the local shops without a pass. Um, as we did these duties, it was a good way to build up relationships with, with what were deemed as a poorly behaved students. Um, we all, at all times followed the school directives, but the more and more we got used to students, we could do this in, in, a, in a good natured way with the students who respected that we had a job to do. And this is not to say they were happy when we caught them in, in their uh, misbehaviour, but um, what it did was it, it got us a chance to be seen that we were there. We would stick to the walls, um, we would face up to any problems with them, and a mutual respect certainly was built up um, over time um, in this. Um, it shouldn't be underestimated um, the importance of how you talk to students outside of the classroom, even when you see them breaking rules. Um, of course, you always stick assertively to what you want to, but the key to my success in my career has been able to talk to students, um, as I said before, on their level um, and understanding what's going on and why and keeping firm, but also fair, uh, friendly manner with, with a human touch, um, where students can see you're following the school rules, um, but you're not saying as though you've got no time for them, you're talking to them with uh, respect throughout. Um, going on school trips as well is a good way to um, be seen around um, outside of the classroom. Um, this can be um, day trips or residential trips, uh, which I, I volunteered to go on in the past, even though they're not my subjects. And this gives you a chance to see students in different environments um, and you can see students showing skills that you don't normally see in, in your lesson every week. Um, and also this creates memories that you can relate to uh, back later on with students and they can see you as well as not someone who's worrying about getting that activity done or that thing copied from the board or is homework in on time. So uh, moving on to one point is communication uh, with parents. So coming, this link's also to 1.4 communication with staff. There are reasons often for poor behavior with students, okay? Could be going uh, something that's going on outside of school. It could be relationship issues uh, with friends. Um, it could be to do with finding the, the lesson too difficult, but not wanting to uh, speak about that. Um, in my experience, uh, communication with parents um, is absolutely vital. Um, and also uh, the vast majority of um, students will improve their behavior if they understand that you're making connection uh, with, with home. Most parents are supportive as long as you're speaking to parents um, in, in, um, in a way that you're looking to find solutions to, their, to the issues that your child is um, given. It's not really much use in just bringing parents to um, vent about their child, that would just put them on the defensive. And um, contacting home in a calm and professional manner for a phone call, an email, a letter, can be um, a really good way of improving matters. Um, some, some students, if they see that you are um, accepting their poor behaviour and they don't see any consequences and they may carry on with their poor behaviour, but if they can see also that you've contacted parents, um, they will see that you can have an effect on what's going on in their home life. Um, and um, this can disempower the students who, who might happily be playing you off against their parent. So I think it's really vital that you um, contact home. Later on in this presentation, I'll be talking about contacting home in, um, in a pos uh, for, for positive reinforcement as well. But to take from this, communication with parents is vital in the fact that it allows parents to see what's going on in a timely manner, um, offering parents um, an ob um, objective overview of what's going on in with their child's behaviour in your classroom and ways forward that are achievable for um, the student and also to support the parent in, in pushing that through at home. Um, vital to get, um, helping your classroom management is, is don't suffer alone and, and talk to your colleagues. Um, a lot of the advice that I'm talking about in this um, presentation has come from um, my colleagues. Um, it's important to remember that we're not alone with poor behaviour. There are teachers going through the same experiences with the same students in your school. Um, there are also teachers in your school who will have excellent techniques in dealing with how um, 
with, with how each student behaves and with the best ways of improving their behaviour. Most teachers, the vast majority in my experience, are more than happy um, to share their experiences with you. Um, as head of faculty, I always advise teachers to share experience of poor behaviour with colleagues in our department and work through different techniques. Sometimes teachers can be reluctant to talk about issues uh, they're having through fear of it reflecting badly on their performance or through just embarrassment or fear of people feeling they cannot um, cope. I don't believe that teachers should feel like this because every teacher I've worked with has been supportive. Um, different teachers um, from different backgrounds um, have their own experiences and over time you can hear many different experiences and decide yourselves which ones you want to take on board and which ones you feel uh, wouldn't work for you um, or for that um, or for that student. Um, I, I will as I go through this presentation talk about some um, pieces of, of advice that I got through um, in my in my career um, from different colleagues. Um, one key bit I'd like to share now is that as a student teacher I thought it was my role to impress my authority at every opportunity with students. Um, and I found that I became, um, you know, someone who was reacting too quickly and maybe on, on things that are too small because I feared that they were not showing me enough respect or my subject enough respect. An experienced teacher in my humanities department pointed out that I was reacting too quickly and jumping on everything. And he told me to step back, not take things personally and let my own personality come out with the students. Um, although this was hard to hear, this is just what I needed to hear too in the long term. And thinking about it, it was, um, you know, I was probably too scared to, to maybe see myself as losing my authority. But I didn't realise that um, was that students were reacting against my over enthusiasm for, for perfection at times. And that was a really important piece of advice um, for my career. And it helped me um, and allowed me to um, allow, show my own personality with students. And over time, that um, led me to be um, one of the most respected students in the school and, and a teacher myself within a few years was actually passing on similar advice to teachers in my school. Um, keeping poor behaviour quiet is not a good idea. You know, students will take advantage of this. Uh, students will see that if they feel you're isolated, you're not contacting other members of staff or other mem or, or members of their family, then, then they will see, um, okay, you might be giving them detentions, but they will see that there's not anything else going on um, outside of this. So speak to form tutors, head of faculty, head of year, um, people um, who are there to support you in the school and parents and this can be done um, to show the student that you are connected you know the lines of um, communication and they know that you can have an effect um, good or bad on their life um, and what goes on with them um, due to their own um, behavior moving on to part two um, inside of the classroom what, I, what I've discussed so far is mainly how to deal um, and a few ideas and how to deal with, with students um, outside of the classroom and who you can communicate with. Um, inside the classroom, 2.1, never speak over a class. Again, this is, this is, this is I'll put this first on, pu on purpose, it's the most important rule. Well, this was told to me by a colleague who had been at the school I taught in, in England for 30 odd years. Um, and it's really important that you insist on silence at all times that you require it. Never give instructions or hold an activity demonstrate or model without being in the knowledge that students are silent. That doesn't mean they're understanding, but it means that they are listening and you can um, then set the activity off and then support the students who need further instructions. My advice is to hold up a class if the students are talking over you and insist on silence before you carry on. A look or speaking to a student using their first names will work in most cases. If it continues after a clear warning, the student can be removed from class with a clear target for the rest of the lesson, which I'll go into in more detail later but for this part of the presentation I want to, to understand uh, that my, my key point is never continue the lesson when the students are talking over you as this will leave some students not knowing what to do in a given activity and students who, who might not know might not be the ones who are talking these might be the students that want to learn but they can't hear properly because other students next to them are whispering or talking to each other and disrupting their <coughs> disrupting their education it's in vital it is vital to be consistent with this rule Insist upon it in your first lesson that some students will continue to talk over you unless they're going to be stopped. Uh, don't expect students to work this out for themselves, that it's the best idea. Some will, others won't and they will continue. So um, you have to set your expectations straight away and you must be consistent with this rule. Um, talking about sharing um, expectations uh, with the class, I think this should be done straight away at the beginning of the class year. 
Um, now this can be done in um, many different ways. Um, one way um, is um, in the first lesson, allow students to, to know that you understand the school rules and you're aware of the school's ex expectations of them as students. And it, it's good to have the school rules um, on the wall of your class or in the student's planner that you can um, refer to. You could elicit and explain the negative behaviour that each, um, each negative behaviour has on their learning. And just important, as importantly, um, the learning of others. A good way of showing your expectations is to put the power in, into the student's hands. Um, create rules of each class, allow students to create their own class rules, um, give, which allows them to give them a voice and a sense of um, empowerment. What you can do that in many ways, you can do it with post-it notes, you could do it with pairs coming together into force to share activities, uh, ideas, sorry, back to the class. These can be voted on and these can be put on a class poster. I have sometimes called this a class constitution and I've referred back to it uh, with uh, when students have uh, broken any of these rules. It's good to get them to sign. You can get them, if you're putting a nice big A3 sheet of paper, you can get students to sign their name on this. Of course, when you're allowing students to um, create their own rules, um, you've got to be the final judge to, just to make sure that these do actually fit in with the school policy and with how you would like the class to go. Most students, of course, understand the rules and understand the behaviour and, and when asked to do this it will be it usually turns into a very positive experience where all feel that they've had some voice in the expectations. So linked to this is showing your awareness of the school's disciplinary policy okay um, the disciplinary policy is um, there to be followed by you as, as a member of staff and it's important that, that they know you're aware of the rules um, and that you can use them um, consistently okay um, and this is important as uh, um, that all other um, teachers in your school are doing this as well, because this um, stops students from being able to play one teacher off against another, claiming that in, in the lesson before years, they were allowed to wear their scarf or they were allowed to chew gum, etc. You don't want to be the teacher who's um, the weak link in the chain of, of the school policy. You must make sure that um, you have the, your expectations and they're set high and they go along with the school's expectations. And if you feel that you're being undermined by, um, if students are undermining you by um, saying that other teachers aren't following that up. You don't, of course, go into dialogue with students on that at the time, but after the lesson, you speak to the person in authority if you feel that the school um, school expectations aren't being, um, aren't being used throughout. But it's really important that students understand that you're part of the system and you know what is going on. Taking control of the class, um, make it clear from the start that you are in charge. Um, you know, sometimes there has to be, um, you have to have the lines to be drawn. You have to have the authority there. And um, when those lines and boundaries are drawn and, and, and total respect is given, then you're allowed to go in and become more human. But the students need to know that any activity in the classroom is happening because you've allowed it to. Whether it's stand up, swap partners, um, debate, uh, hands up or shout out, it's there because you, uh, want it to be and that you can take it back um, to the start of the lesson where everyone sat in silent if you want to. Bringing a noise level down after noise activity is, is a key skill in this. It can be done through um, carefully choosing um, the type of the activity in the lesson which, which I'll come to um, in a minute um, and thinking about how your lesson plan um, should allow reflect the fact that you are in control at all times even if you have um, chaos, it's organised chaos, it's your chaos, and the students must be aware that you are um, in total control of, of the class, because if you're not, then, then that's when the problems can start. Okay, um, so moving on to setting up um, lessons um, beforehand. So, um, of course, as teachers, we, we have extremely busy workloads. Um, so I, I believe that it's, it's really important that before the school day, we get ourselves ready that we can um, get the lessons going um, beforehand so when the students walk into your class and the resources are in place uh, the starters on the board or the lesson outline aims objectives on the board and screen this allows you to focus on students as they arrive um, it doesn't you know it doesn't make the start of the best lesson if when they arrive you're rushing around trying to find the textbooks trying to find their classroom books in a box because you've done marking the night before the state of the room and resources can have a big impact on how the lesson is seen from the point of view of the student and how their behaviour is going to un unfold. Um, I've had students comment to me many times in the past um, how the state of the classroom and the implied readiness of the teacher at the start of the lesson sets the mood for the lesson. If you look unprepared, um, you're playing catch up with the students and they may well be um, able to take advantage of this if they wish to do so. Um, 
I'll, I'll go through some strategies in a minute on on, on um, different ways that you can you can help do that. Um, so let's move on to, to entering um, and leading the classroom. I, I think you should have high expectations about the start and end of a lesson. A strong start and ending creates a great framework for a lesson and gives students a clear message of um, what you expect and how you expect them to act in the classroom. So if possible, and if it fits in with your school's um, policy, I believe lining them up outside is very important and get some quiet if they enter. Um, if students enter in an inappropriate fashion, um, I believe it, it, it sets a bad tone for the, for the rest of the lesson. And I certainly would um, have no qualms about get, getting them outside and making them do that again, um, coming in in an orderly fashion. Um, <clears throat> even if before the lesson you've let students in, going back to my last point, and let's say it's a lesson after break or lunch where you've let students in to help you set up resources, um, or they you, you allow them to have lunch in, um, in your room, I believe that when the lesson starts, I, I make them go outside again to give a clear indication that previous activities, the previous atmosphere that was there before lesson is over and the lesson is now beginning. Um, as they do go into the classroom, um, stand by the door and welcome them as they enter. Uh, and then again, quick comments on the football results or topic of interest with the students as they enter can create a welcoming atmosphere. Remember, they're coming into your lesson, you're there to educate, but you're also there to make them feel welcome and to set a learning environment where they all feel welcome and respected. Have the classroom set up, as said before, so they can start work. Um, and that can be done you know, with the title, um, the aims, objectives, or a handout, or a, a thinking starter on the board um, as they go in. So a, a good activity is with a starter, um, a recap from last lesson or, or activating prior knowledge on what you're about to teach. And that, that um, allows students who settle down quicker, who are more organised to have something to do rather than you sitting and waiting for all 30 or so students to be, to be ready to start. Um, it might only take 30 seconds for it all to calm down, but those 30 seconds of that lesson um, are not wasted. Um, I think it's very important to insist that if you do a school register that it's done in silence. Of course, uh, we, don't, we can't have mistakes with, with um, looking at school attendance, but also um, to assert your order on the class. Remember that this is your domain, okay? Um, the, end of, the end of the lesson as well is also important in concerning behaviour. A good plenary that involves a whole class is a good final activity and leaving the, the classroom can be built into it. A, a variety of ways such as next answer leave first or one boy answers correctly, all the boys can leave um, are fun and work well, certainly at secondary level. Um, it's important during your busy day, as I said, to have as much time as possible getting students um, to um, do some of the donkey work for you. So um, collecting books for the last minute, um, putting them in a pile, putting out resources for the next um, class are good ways of saving you important minutes before the next class comes in. This works especially well if you don't have any minutes between lessons in your school. Um, also make sure that resources are put back um, from this class, um, they're collected in, they're put on the correct shelf, etc. Because otherwise, and I learned this very quickly in my career, if you just let students walk out at the end of the class, Without any good management, you could be stood there with tables and chairs um, out of place, with 30 odd exercise book, textbooks, paper everywhere, glue everywhere. Um, you really got to make sure that the end of your, the beginning and end of your um, lessons are really structured uh, with, with good activities for, for the classes and opportunities for students. You know, and it takes a, a student a second or two to put his or her book into a pile and pass it into the next student up to the front. That's saving you five minutes of doing that. Um, when they leave, after they've left. Of course, end the lesson with a nice goodbye. And it's nice if you've got a minute you know, or less to end with um, some news um, about something not related to the lesson, an upcoming school event, etc. Um, and a good luck to any anything that's going on with the school event that day. Lesson plans and activities. Well, with your class, of course, you, of course, it's vital to go to any um, lesson uh, well prepared. Um, but I think it's important that when you when you go in with your lesson plan that you, you have you have activities adaptable to your class and to keep your management and to keep you in control. You know your students, and as you get to, to teach them more, you will understand whether or not um, a think pair share followed by a group activity followed by um, responding to a video works well in that order. Now, do is it good for that class to get the students up, talkative, and how do you bring them back down? Um, my advice here is to be adaptable, is to have different activities up your sleeve. What I don't mean is, OK, shut up and copy out the, the textbook for the rest of the lesson. That's obviously not a good approach to um, teaching or learning. But to have um, lots of starter, uh, sort of lots of classroom activities on hand that you feel work well to 
um, really assert your control and assert um, a good learning environment onto your lesson. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about those activities now because as you can see on my YouTube channel, um, there are lots of teaching and learning activities and I think um, it's, it's really good practice to understand and be brave enough to understand that actually in this lesson, this activity is causing that group to be too noisy or that student is not reacting well with that student, so I need to change it. And it doesn't hurt to stop, reflect, as I said, talk to other teachers about how that class responds to different activities. Clear instructions. Instructions are vital in at the vital part of the learning process. It's, it's, it's important to be strong and clear in your instructions. Poor behaviour, rightly or wrongly, can come from students being unsure of what ex is expected of them and that may, um, or how to do an activity, and that may come down to one, you presented your, your instructions poorly, two, you, you presented them well, they're clear, but students are not listening. Showing confidence in your delivery of what you're asking the students to do will give them the impression that it's worthwhile, of course. Instructions should be given with the class in silence and should also be written, whether on the board, um, interactive white, uh, whiteboard or a handout, as well as orally, where appropriate. The inst this instruction on the board or screen is a useful reference for students who um, are unsure of what to do, where they can go back and check. Also, if a student is off task, you can point them on where to go. Clear, understandable instructions that the students can refer back to will help to keep them on task and will lower the amount of low-level misbehaviour which can occur when students are not sure of what to do, having missed out on vital instructions. Your job as a teacher when you're given the instructions, of course, is to monitor, go around and see how students are reacting to them. But they always need somewhere to go to. Um, think about you as a listener. How much, even in a quiet room, how much do you remember um, after a first few minutes? People do daydream even when quiet. So your instructions must be clear, they must be achievable, and they must be written down for students. And that will help with classroom management. Seating plan, I mean, trade a seating plan. A seating plan um, can be, um, of course, done at the beginning of the class. Uh, if you don't know the class, this can be done randomly at first. Um, and then it can be changed depending on your experience to see who does work, who works well, or who doesn't work well with other students. Um, of course, a, a seating plan at the start of the class written down will allow you to have a plan in the class so you can um, learn students' names because calling a student by a name is far uh, better at getting quiet. So, you know, um, quieting down, please, Jack, is, is, is far more um, effective than just saying, Oi, you be quiet. So it's really good to have a seating plan to get to know the students. Um, within the seating plan, uh, there must be um, an area where um, they must have this the seat where you believe students are going to work and where you believe students um, are going to uh, um, be allowed to get on with their work without the interference of others. Now, the seating plan, what I've always done with my seating plan is, is I've had my seating plan. Now, I'm a teacher who does a lot, as you can see from my channel, uh, interactive activities. So I may want to change the plan throughout um, the lesson and I will then put them students in different groups or get them moving around but at all times I will have my um, if you like um, base plan which I will say to students okay back to the seating plan and then they must know where they are uh, which which also is, is a really good indicator of the end of an activity. Um, I think it's really important that you are in control of the seating plan do not let yourself be manipulated and don't let students nag you to make them move um, and, and, and sulk until they're sat next to their best friend you've got to be brave um, and you've got to stand up and be counted here that, that the seating plan must be arranged so that students um, are in the best position to um, to work well in the classroom. Um, it's always good to have a spare table in your seating plan which which can be used as um, an, an internal exclusion if things are going wrong with the student within any particular lesson. Um, student plans um, can be changed um, every few weeks, every month. Um, again, um, you know, you, you, you can decide that yourself. Um, however, you can, you know, almost um, make it a what, monthly thing where so you get students to work, depending on the lesson and depending on the type of classes you do, you're getting students to work with a variety of different students in the classroom. Um, but the, the key to a, um, a seating plan is that you're in charge of it, uh, that it's, it's geared towards an area of the room where everybody knows this is the base um, of where they seat and it's up to you who changes where and when, and you can always put them back um, where you want to do. Um, as you get to know classes better throughout the year, the seating plan will be will be a lot easier. However, I do believe that it's, it's good um, classroom management for the students to know throughout the year that you have decided where they sit, and it's not just a case that they just come into the classroom and sit where they like. 
So taking into account all, account all of that, what about when things do go wrong? Well, um, I believe when students are misbehaving, it's important to give them a choice, allowing them to, to um, take responsibility over their actions, um, allowing them a way out, allowing them um, to save face, if you like. Let's never underestimate how important it is for students to save face in front of their uh, peers. But also by, by doing this, you're allowing students to um, have a way out, which also will result in improved behaviour. Choices such as you can choose to either learn quietly or choose to lose your break time, or you can carry on making a noise and be moved, or you can choose to settle down and start work, allowing me to trust where you sit, to sit where you are, are hard for students to argue against and puts the onus on them to make the right decisions. If you're making choices to students, make them clear. It's a good idea again to write them down, whether that's in their um, textbook, sorry, in, in, in their exercise book or their homework diary or planner. It's really good to refer to these back at the end of the lesson, one or two, one, two or three targets, clearly explain what you want them to do. And at the end of the lesson, you could put a tick um, or cross um, next to them. And this can go down um, and, and um, it's hard for students to um, argue against these. Um, when dealing with students who don't accept your instructions or that have done anything wrong, um, give them a way out. Um, don't, don't back them into the corner in front of the class, force them to face um, lose face, as I said, because um, what that does is um, can change a small situation and this can be blown into um, all out of perspective due to the student thinking they're getting frustrated and they think that they've got to um, look um, look important, look big in front of their, uh, their friends, okay? You need to make sure that you get the required behavior that you want um, without standoffs and with you gaining mutual respect with the student and in the class and in front of and in front of the class it's no it's not a good idea to get into yes no arguments as some students will happily continue these which can lead to a war of attrition um, and lead to things being said that you don't um, and going to places where you really don't want to go um, um, a good strategy i learned when dealing with students in this situation which i'll come to now is um, asking students to um, speak to them without an audience um, now this is 2.11 and um, uh, in doing this in, um, Instead of, you know, and we've all done it and hold my hands up here, instead of, you know, shouting, get out, um, which may lead to them arguing back, saying it wasn't me, I don't have any, I didn't do anything, why should I? It's better to say, you know, very firmly, um, I'd like to discuss, I'd like to hear your side of the story outside uh, where we can have a calm conversation, which is a good technique in giving them a chance to, to make the correct decision to your satisfaction, um, again, without them feeling that um, they've lost face and without them having... Um, to be able to manipulate the argument into the way the tone of voice you've taken. Um, so when you're out, when you're outside uh, the class with with the student, of course, I, I don't believe you should leave them outside for too long, but allow time for you both to call off if necessary. And uh, not too much time. Students may wander off, um, and then you've got different types of problems. But um, clearly, when you're outside with, with students, clearly state your case um, to them what's happened. Um, and again, set them targets. Now, I found in my career that when, when they're taken away from the stage of the classroom, their attitude can change very quickly and they become much more willing to listen um, and comply with the targets when it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, effective ideas and targets, as I said before, can be written down, uh, should be written down. And I believe it's very important that you do go back to these um, targets with the students, because if you set them these targets and you fail to uh, follow up on them, the student will not uh, forget that and word will, will get around that, yeah, your, your bark is worse than your bite and all you've got to do, what they've got to do is nod at what you say and you'll forget and then next lesson it may be repeated behaviour. Moving on to speaking assertively and sticking to the point, this is very important because some students would love to sway you off your point and manipulate the conversation with you into, I didn't do it, yes you did, no I didn't, yes you did. Um, you know, if you've seen the student throw a textbook, don't ask why did you throw the textbook as a common response will be I didn't or, or so and so didn't you didn't say anything to them why are you asking me um, it's better to say um, use assertive discipline you will not throw textbooks in the classroom textbooks will not be thrown um, within this school and again you can point to school rules on that um, and again um, this is good to give students a choice you can either treat properly with respect or we will have to um, deal with it and this may mean me keeping you in a break, me asking, me contacting home and asking your parents to replace a textbook. These are logical statements and these are hard for students to argue again. It's hard for someone to, to say, no, actually, I think it is okay for me to throw a textbook. Um, 
as I said, it's a good idea to use your knowledge of school rules here um, when speaking to the student. And this helps you explain why the behavior is not acceptable. And it takes it away from a UV them, um, you know, butting heads. Um, it's argued for them. It's, it, it, it's hard for them to argue against the school rules. They've chosen to be at the school. Their parents have accepted the school rules as they come in. You don't use them um, as a stick to beat them with. But you could say, as you see from the school rules poster here, all property must be treated with respect. Again, hard for them to argue against. If they do argue, calmly repeat yourself and don't get drawn into secondary arguments. You didn't say anything when X threw it last week. It's important to calmly but firmly tell and repeat if necessary why their behavior is not acceptable and the choice you're giving them. Don't throw it again or. Don't shout in anger. Now, um, of course, again, I hold my hands up. Um, I have, of course, in my, in my career shouted and there are times when we react emotionally. However, I don't believe that in the long run, this does you or the students um, any good at all. Um, if you are known as a teacher that shouts, students will learn which buttons to press to get a reaction from you. Believe it or not, some students will enjoy seeing you get angry and worked up and going red in the face. Um, most situations can be dealt with quickly by an assertive target, quick word or look. Getting angry allows the students to get into a secondary argument with, with you, like you were, you were rude to me, which then takes away from the attention from their initial piece of poor behaviour, which, of course, is what they want. More often than not, shouting doesn't work. Now, it can work for students who are usually well behaved uh, or have committed a low piece of misbehaviour. It works for students um, who are not giving long term problems. But I found through, you know, a, a, a quick shout can make them fall back into line quickly. Um, however, shouting at repeat offenders doesn't have much effect. If it did, then surely they'd be behaving, wouldn't they, in the first place? Do you really think you're the first person to ever shout at them? This may be going on all the time at home. This may be going on all the time in other lessons. And it's just a noise to them. Um, as I said, a quick blast can work uh, if you're aiming at, at a whole class. Um, however, students can, uh, sorry, shouting at students can lead to students shouting back. And this can, you know, lead to a situation where you don't want to lose face. The teacher, you've got to keep your authority over the class and the student doesn't want to lose face in front of his or her peers. Uh, shouting, of course, doesn't look good. Your eyes water, you, you go red and it's, and, and it's a mistake to think that, um, so it's always going to get uh, what you want. It's better to use your, your voice well and speak in a loud, assertive voice, um, which you are in control of. And it's the key here when asserting a voice is, is a, an effective, loud blast, which um, is in control, which um, doesn't make you end up looking stupid and a spectacle in front of the whole class. I myself am quite lucky to have a naturally loud voice and found that raising it and then lowering it without shouting was a powerful tool and students learned um, to respond to it. A quick burst of loudness at the start of a sentence, such as telling the class, it's time to get together for feedback, that can gain the student's attention, and your voice can then lower in the same sentence the class and quietens. <clears throat> a clear loud voice, therefore, is not done with aggression or the anger of a shout, and it can get, um, which can get results without you losing your composure. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a key tool to getting good behavior is to show confidence in front of students, and this using your voice in an assertive manner will go a long way in showing this. A confident, assertive voice allows students to know that you're in charge of what goes on in the classroom. There's a big difference between this and shouting. Um, being assertive allows you to keep control um, and it stops you becoming an exhibition. Um, this takes me back to a deputy head teacher I used to work with. Um, she once commented to me how I used to shout a lot in my early days when I was fighting for control over classes. And she explained that I came across sometimes as an angry teacher and how she saw an improvement in how I came across when I learned to use my voice in an assertive, controlled manner. And I took a lot from that conversation and reflected how I must have come across in, um, to a class of teenagers in my early days as a teacher. There were far better ways, which I hope I've touched on a couple here, to get um, the desired effect from students rather than just shouting. Another, another good tactic is, uh, a piece of advice, sorry, is, is don't make threats or give multiple warnings. You must act quickly and never give idle threats. Follow through at all times. Students will very quickly realize when you don't follow through on your warnings and they will take advantage. When you do finally follow up, they will point out that you previously, previously let another student get away with the same offense. And this can then lead to secondary problems and give them a chance again to um, <coughs> guide the attention away from their original um, misbehavior. Follow up on warnings straight away. 
It's good to give one warning and let them know your expectations. But if it doesn't stop, you follow up straight away as this will set out a clear message to the whole class that you are a teacher that will follow through on your expectations. If you don't follow up on your threats, it's unfair to students who want to learn and having their learning time disrupted by misbehavior of others. So if you're constantly saying, be quiet or I'll leave you, be quiet if, I'm, if I'll leave you, and you don't because you don't, because you are maybe scared of how the student's going to react, then it's not going, it's not having good um, consequences um, for the other students in the class, especially the ones that want to learn. And remember, our, our, our responsibility, and indeed the responsibility of all, is to allow the right to education to happen. It's important to remember that all students have a right to learn and it's our responsibility to ensure this, which means we must deal with misbehaviour quickly. If, we, if it isn't, some students will keep on misbehaving. In my experience, behaviour improves when students are clear what the boundaries are. You must stick to these boundaries. It doesn't help anyone if you move them because you don't want to challenge poor behaviour because you've heard that so-and-so is, is a student that's going to be rude or show you off in front of the class. Don't be scared to face issues head on. It will show them that you mean business and you will gain their respect. It may be tough at first, but you've got to go through and show that you can stand up to the, um, the poor misbehaved students or any students that, that feels that they can dictate who does the learning, where and when in your classroom. And, and they will see that not only are you gaining respect, but you will see that you've got their uh, best interests at heart as well. Um, if you deal with the first problem in an assertive manner, it will set a good precedent. Ignoring misbehaviour, hoping it goes away, very rarely works in my experience. And it makes it harder for you to assert your authority on the class in the long run. Um, so that comes to facing, um, linked to facing issues head on. Um, ignoring problems don't make it go away. Um, students may not seem to like it, but they will respect you if you follow them up. Um, <clears throat> An example I'd like to use for this, this part is, um, as a new teacher, I had a very challenging uh, year 10 class that I started as they were starting their GCSE. And it was, it was an optional subject. It was something that they had to do, GCSE citizenship in its early days. And this class, um, you know, didn't want to be there, not just in my class, but in school. But I, I, I followed advice and I made sure that I um, faced every issue head on. This is very time consuming for me. A lot of meetings, a lot of paperwork which on top of a very busy teaching schedule at the start of a very steep learning curve of a teacher was very hard and time consuming for me, but it was worth it in the long run. And I met one of the students um, out from this class outside of school a few years later, and he told me that the class always respected me as I didn't let them get away of anything and I stood my ground. And that was really great to hear because I didn't know at the time that I was, I was gaining their respect, but they liked the fact that I stood my ground. Um, over time, the behaviour did work in the class. Again, um, going back to a very early point, is getting to know students outside of class. I remember meeting one of the students there um, at, uh, after a um, Tottenham West Ham football match. I was in the top, Tottenham end at Upton Park and um, saw him afterwards, uh, said a quick hello. You know, we weren't particularly get, um, getting on well in my class at the time with, with behaviour. But on the Monday, he came to talk to me about how the match was and how impressed he was to see me in West Ham's away end. That meant a good way to improving his behaviour in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> and going back to the title of this, facing his issues head on really was key to me gaining the respect of that class. So uh, there, will, there will be times when you need to punish um, students. And one way you can do this is, is taking away their time um, in detentions. Um, now, I believe you should use detentions wisely and use them to your advantage. Um, you can use detentions as a chance to speak to the student about their behaviour and set out your future expectations. Where possible, don't use them just to punish them for no reason, make them sit in silence or just to rant at them or to do lines of courses. Um, they should be used to speak through what happened and explain to them where they went wrong, in your opinion, and how they need to improve next time. How their behaviour had an effect on their learning and the learning of others. It's also a good opportunity to find out their reasons for their misbehaviour. Uh, it may take time for students to feel they can trust you, to talk to you and open up to you like this, but if you build up um, the relationship and you see to the student that even though um, you're in a detention you are there and you are willing to talk and you're willing to listen and that will go a long way to building up um, trust between you um, and will in, indeed in, improve behaviour um, and I, I, I've got counsel's um, memories in, in my career of, of having detention with a student and over time talking to them understanding where they're coming from you know it might be hard hard to think about it but it might be her asset next to it. it might be the lesson it might be your instructions weren't clear um and of course that can be hard for us, us to hear and you've got to be you know you've also got to be able to trust a student that they're not just saying it to get out of any problem but also it, detentions 
um, can be a time for you to reflect on what's gone um, as, as well. Um, don't use your tensions in anger. 15 minutes after school, 30 minutes after school, you then become um, a joke to them. And I saw a lot of student teachers that I've trained over years use that as their power. Uh, detentions for some students aren't a deterrent or why you look through their homework diary, their planner, they, they, they've had hundreds over the school year. Um, they should be used as a time to try to build knowledge on the student, set expectations of what you expect in the future um, with them as well. Humour. Using humour can be, uh, when appropriate, can work in classroom behaviour. <coughs> this can help to diffuse situations, and sometimes when students can't see that you don't automatically lose your temper and able to give um, a witty comment to let them know uh, where you want the situation to go from there, that can be a way to get your respect um, and respect for better behaviour um, in your class. However, I would say be very be, be careful with humour. You, you shouldn't go down this route unless you know your students well, um, as well as them knowing you well before using it. Using the wrong humour could leave a student embarrassed, uh, humiliated or backed into a corner and may create a situation where they respond with a comment back to you, which goes over the line, which is over the border. Um, and it could be deemed, be deemed as them being rude to you, but you're left with the awkward situation where you actually started that situation by a sarcastic comment. OK, sarcasm. When I mean humour, I don't mean sarcasm as well. Humour has a big part, uh, played a big part in my relationship with students. Um, <clears throat> I've used it to put um, an end to uh, uh, um, some, some, you know, small behaviour things in class and stop students speaking out of turn. Um, going back many years now, the JLS song, you know, um, everybody in love, put your hands up. Some students used to sing that a lot um, in class. And then um, I sang back to them in one class. If you want to speak in class, you must put your hand up and sing it now. Um, it got a laugh. Um, and the kids, you know, again, it was me showing I was, I, I was knowing what was going on with music at the time. Um, and that class, that that song, that that song and that snippet um, became kind of like an in joke with our class. Um, and I feel um, you know that that was something that we could we could um, kind of meet in uh, in the middle. Of course, when I was saying um, that through the a JLS song, I was sticking to the fact you can't speak in class without putting your without putting your hand up. You can't just be um, singing music songs as 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 you as you feel like in my class. Um, when you are doing humour, you've got to understand there must be a line that is understood by you and the students. And this can't be taught to students in the lesson. It must be built up over time. Um, it can be used if properly as a good way of students know um, how you feel about their behaviour. But it must be built from a position of mutual respect and a good understanding of how the class will react. One word um, out of place can go, um, can go wrong, <clears throat> as I've said. And I've seen that um, a few times over the years when, when training um, student teachers myself. Finally, uh, rewarding good behaviour for all. Um, students like um, acknowledgement of, of, of good of good work and good behaviour. Um, I've done things in in the past, such as having you know um, some some teachers um, put names on board, but I, I I've had a happy face on the board. You can use it nice with emojis as well now of um, good behaviour. Good behaviour, so it's on the board. Don't just award positive behaviour to students who. Um, have been mis misbehaving in the past as a way of placating them, use it for all. Um, recognise good behaviour of someone who's been good but quiet the whole year as well. Secondary students may not show up, but they do want recognition for good behaviour and achievements, even if they may claim to be too cool to recognise it. I've had on more than one occasion me um, offering house points for <coughs> good work, uh, good behaviour, etc. In, in class and the students, you know, being too cool to accept it and then come back later and ask for it. I believe it's really important, going back to what I said about parents, that you show parents positive recognition. Um, many parents over the years have told me how much they value positive letters, phone calls or comments in homework diary, um, showing rewarding good behaviour for all students and, and good work for all students. Recognition um, can range from merit system, class applause, naming a hat um, for an end of term prize, if appropriate for your score, you see that for Easter eggs at Easter or section boxes at Christmas, let us home, a quick note to the form tutor, head of year, or a simple well done to a student, which can make them feel appreciated and maybe something they don't um, often hear. So there's some um, ideas I've, I've got on um, classroom behaviour, um, classroom management, and some techniques that I've used in my career. Um, please get in touch with me in any of the ways you can see on the screen now. Um, everything I've said in this um, presentation I do have um, typed up uh, with my written instructions so if you would like a copy of those 
please email me oliverfurnival at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening.